the book of Proverbs chapter 18. And of course, I want us to read verses 15. If you're kind enough, put NLT for us. In a count of three, we all read with power. One, two, three. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Uh -huh. Their ears are open for knowledge. My God. Do I have intelligent people here today? Well, I do. Well, I do. The Bible says intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. And of course, one will ask, ask and say, but Apostle, why is that intelligent people are always ready to learn? That's the Bible that we have just read there. It's because it takes intelligence to know and to understand that what's true today may be a lie tomorrow. And what was true yesterday may be a lie today, not because it was not true yesterday. Can I say that again? It takes intelligence for one to understand that what's true today may be a lie tomorrow. Not because it was not uh, true today. Let me come down to your level. You'll hear me in a while. It takes intelligence, or rather wisdom, so to say, but we'll use the word intelligence because the Bible says intelligent people are always ready to learn. It takes intelligence for one to know and to understand that what's true today may be a lie tomorrow. It does not mean it was not true today or it was not true yesterday. Are you with me? And the reason being is because life is lived forward but understood backwards. That's why when we learn, we evolve. And that is because change, or rather truth, so to say, does not change, but things around us, they change. And because things around us, they change, they alter the truth. And as a result, what's true today, that's why as we grow, we evolve until you reach a level where you go, I wish I did not say it the way I said it. It means you are not evolving. That's why every person here, once in a while you go, if I knew better, I would not have done it that way. But you did it that way then because that's what happened and that's what appeared to be true for you that time. So you did what you did and you made the decisions you made that time because according to your understanding that time, what you did was true. But now after you did it, maybe let's say three days later, you sit down with yourself and you say, yeah, I should not have done that. But when you did it, you knew you were doing a right thing. But three days later, it does not appear like it's the right thing. And that is because it takes intelligence for you to understand that what's true today may be a lie tomorrow. And it does not mean it was not true yesterday. Does that make sense to you? So you are in another time and you are like, wait a minute. I should not have treated that person the way I treated that person. But while you were treating them, you knew you were doing the right thing. But now, because it's three days later, you go, wait a minute, I should have done better. And the reason why you feel like you should have done better is because you have evolved. It's because you have grown. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you have reached a certain level of intelligence because the same person that you were yesterday could not come again and say, I wish I said it better. The same person you were yesterday will stand by what they said yesterday because there is nothing that has taken place in your life. So you know you are growing when you look back and you go like, there, I should have said it this way. Hence, we are saying life is lived forward but understood backwards. That's why we say intelligent people, they learn not from their mistakes but from the mistakes of others. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 18, 
In a count of three, we all read one, two, three. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Uh -huh. For it is he that giveth thee power to get well, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers, uh -huh. as it is this day. May God bless his word. Please pay attention. Those who are writing, now you can start writing. I said it a few weeks ago, and I'm going to say it again. That Deuteronomy 8, verses 18, focuses on four things. Number one, God. Number two, power. Number three, wealth. Number four, covenant. And I said it, and I said it, and I said it, and I will say it again. That for the purpose of my teaching, or rather this series, we are going to focus on three things. God, we are going to focus on power, and we are also going to focus on wealth. And of course, we understand that there is a word covenant there. And if you are going to put these four things together, you will understand that God gives power for one to get wealth, not so that they can show off, but so that he himself, God, can establish his covenant. So he's not giving out this wealth for one to go around and flaunt it, but he's giving out this wealth so that at the end, his covenant must or may be established. Meaning as long as I am in pursuit of kingdom wealth, kingdom wealth meaning wealth given by God because there is worldly wealth and there is kingdom wealth. So as long as I'm after the kind of wealth that is given by God, we call it kingdom wealth, I need now to really redefine my motive or motivation of pursuing kingdom wealth or wealth. Meaning every time I want the wealth that I'm going to have to be from God, that wealth or rather my motive of seeking that wealth must be attached to his covenant. Because the reason why God gives wealth is for his covenant. But now I want you to focus on where we are going today. The number one thing that one must always remember for them to get wealth as God's children is that they must be power. And they must be a bringing of this power. And then it is this power that helps a child of God either to attract wealth or to locate wealth. Because not everybody is meant to attract it. Some people are meant to locate it. But the good news is, at the end of the day, you are going to get wealth. Say, oh Lord, oh Lord. bless me. Amen. And last week, we then mentioned that that power that the Bible is talking about, the power to get wealth, it is not dunamis. Because dunamis is what we read about in Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon your life. This is not Kretas, this is not Iskus, this is not Exousia, this is not uh, 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 generated power, this is not even Anakazo, this is not Epikaizo we are talking about. But the power we are talking about there is wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. So in simpler ways, God gives one wisdom, rather God will give you wisdom and it is that wisdom that will help you get wealth. And in getting of the wealth, God will establish his covenant. Say, talk to me, Apostle. What that means is because if God now, according to the scripture, gives power, and the power gets you where wealth is, it then means wisdom has the ability to lead you to where wealth is. Is. Does that make sense to you guys? Because now we are no longer just talking about power, but we are talking about wisdom because the power there that the Bible is talking about is wisdom. So I'm going to use the word wisdom as we continue. Is that okay with you? Is that okay with you? So it then means God gives you wisdom and it is that wisdom that, that gets you wealth. Does that make sense? So if I get hold of wisdom, I will get hold of what? Of wealth. But I cannot get hold of wealth before getting hold of what? Wisdom. But I cannot have the wisdom if I don't have a relationship with God. Because the relationship with God then allows me 
or rather puts me in a position where God can give me the wisdom. So I cannot go after the wisdom. I have to go after God. Though the wisdom is the one that gives me wealth. But I have to make sure that before I pursue the wisdom, I have to pursue God. Because God is the one who gives what? The wisdom. So I don't go after the wisdom. I don't go after the wealth in that sense. But I have to make sure that I have a relationship with who? With the giver of the wisdom. Because God now becomes what? My source. What, is, what wealth gets me is what? Resources. And wisdom is the one that gets me the resources. So we have God here being the source. We have wisdom here. And then we have wealth that gets you the resources. So what I'm saying to you in simpler terms, you are not to focus on the resources. You are not to fight to get the resources. Neither pursue the wisdom in that sense until you have a relationship with God. Because once you have a relationship with God, you qualify for wisdom. That's why the Bible says in the book of James chapter 1 verses 5, If anyone among you here lack wisdom, let him ask and the God that gives generously. So you are asking to God and you are asking God for wisdom because you already have a relationship with God. Hallelujah. So God has to be my wealth. God has to be my source. God has to be my reason of seeking everything. So God is my number one source. Praise the Lord, everybody. So once I connect to God, God, by his loving heart, he gives me wisdom. And that wisdom now will shake the dust of poverty out of me. I wish I could talk to somebody right here. And the reason why God gives you wisdom is because wisdom creates decisions. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That creates wealth. That was powerful. So wisdom creates decisions that creates wealth. Because your wealth is not something that just comes. There must be a power. There must be a bringing of power. There must be wisdom that comes to you in order for you to locate the wealth. But you don't locate the wealth because you prayed and you said, you know what, now I have wisdom. That wisdom now will help you create decisions and those decisions will create wealth. Kahina Mahanda. That's why I said uh, last week, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it again and again. You see, or rather you will see, the power of wisdom or the presence of wisdom in the quality of the decisions you make. So the decisions you make in life tells you the amount of wisdom that has been bestowed in your life. Say, I hear you, Apostle. So when you deal with the power of decision-making or choice-making, you realize that you don't choose what? Consequences. But you choose the choices and decisions you, what? you make in life. Nobody here has the ability to choose consequences. But what you have power over is the decision you make. And the decision you make will summon consequences. That's why some of you, if you made that decision that you made uh, out of wisdom, you will not be attracting the consequences that you are attracting now. If some of you were to rewind your life and take you five years ago, and you decided not by human's wisdom, but God's wisdom. What you are dealing with right now, you will not be dealing with it now. When you see a 60 years old man walking, you are not seeing a 60 years old man walking. You are seeing decisions of a 20 year old in that person. Somebody write a book for me. This is powerful, man. So when you see a 50-year-old walking like that, in that person is decisions and choices of a 20-year-old them. That if you were to give them an opportunity and say, go back, some decisions they will not make them. 
Because there are decisions in life that once you make it, it will cost you your whole life to undo it. Are you hearing me? That's why we say it's very difficult to pray out something you brought by ignorance. I said, somebody, you better write me a book now. Are you hearing me? It is very difficult to pray out, I rebuke it, something that you brought in by ignorance. That is why God, as his children, he has given us an upper hand by giving us wisdom. No matter how great you think you are, no matter how gifted you think you are, the moment God calls you, before he sends you, before he commissions you, kneel down and cry for wisdom. Because without wisdom, your anointing and your gifting will take you up the roof, but your ignorance will bring you down. So there are people who are gifted, who are anointed, but because they lack wisdom, it will appear as if this person was never gifted or no anointed. Say, talk to me, Apostle. So you don't choose consequences. I feel something. I feel, I feel it. I, feel, I, I even feel it right where I'm sitting. I feel it in my chair. It's like fire shutting my bones. And listen to me. About 5,000 people that are under the influence of my voice right now. Your life shall never be the same again. I'm not here to joke. I'm not a joker. I was not born to joke jokes. I was born to prophesy. I was born to impact lives. I was born to change lives. And I'm here today by the Spirit of God to redirect your life in Christ Jesus. And if you are one of the 5,000 that I'm here to talk to, just lift up your right hand and say, talk to me, Apostle. Please be seated in the Holy Ghost. So you don't choose consequences. This has to get in your spirit, especially if you are a young person. Don't, don't, don't look around and try to act cute. Right now, get hold of what I'm saying. You don't choose consequences. You choose what? Decisions. That's why I always tell you that one minute of you looking sexy without wisdom will put you in five minutes of sex. That will put you in 30 years of child support. You will be raising a being alone, yet you did not bring that being bring alone in this world. That if you had wisdom, you will have seen intentions. You will have seen actions. But because you made decisions outside of wisdom, all you saw were words. Now there are consequences attached to your yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ah, the church is too quiet. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. I said, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. So what then comes to torment you is consequences. But those consequences did not just come out of nowhere. Your decision summoned them. That's why some of you, you say, if only I did not go to that place. One, two, three will not have happened. But for you to go there, you didn't wake up there. You made a decision. To go there. So wisdom, when he comes on you, he helps you with decisions more than anything. That's why we say God gives you wisdom. It is then that wisdom that creates decisions that create wealth. Say, talk to me, Apostle. So the assignment of wisdom is to guide you using the knowledge of scripture under the influence of the Holy Ghost so that through knowledge, through enlightenment, you can apply what you know. In other words, I cannot apply what I know until wisdom comes or I'm, until I operate because... Even when it comes to applying truth, it takes wisdom. 
Not all truth is to be applied or to be seen as truth. It takes wisdom to know what truth to say when. So you see, there are people, because of lack of wisdom, they think I have truth, let me say it. And the truth backfires. And instead of the truth helping them go up, the truth is helping them go down. And they go back to the mirror and say, but what I said is right. Yes, you said it right, but you said it out of wisdom. Not all truth is supposed to go out because it's truth. Why would the word of God speak of mysteries belonging to God? God is a God who is truthful. But the Bible says secrets, they belong to him. Why will God be a God of truth and still have secrets? Because there are certain things that once they are revealed to men, instead of building men, they will destroy men. So it is very important for you to get what? Wisdom. But in all thy getting, get understanding. So the assignment of wisdom then is to guide you, like I said, so that when you make decisions, you make right decisions. If you don't have wisdom, nothing great will be done by you. I did not say you will not do anything. I said nothing great will be done by you. Because some people, they confuse productivity with activity. Just because you are doing something, it does not mean you are doing something. Activity is not productivity. That's why people who are everywhere, not nowhere in life, they love complaining because according to them, because I'm doing something, something must happen. And life is not like that, brothers and sisters. Just because you are doing something, it does not mean something must happen. What then determines the results in what you are doing is wisdom. That's why we can go to the street, sell the same thing, do the same thing, and then come up with different results. And put cases aside here, because some of you are not cursed, you just don't have wisdom. And because the enemy does not want you to know that what you don't have is wisdom, he brings this thing of you are cursed. And the greatest curse, I'm not saying you are not cursed, but here's the greatest curse. The greatest curse is ignorance. Brothers and sisters, believe it or not, the greatest curse that can ever be lifted off your life and your children and your generation is a, a curse of ignorance. That's why there are people who don't know God the way you know God, but will always do better than you. And you always go before God and say, God, how come I believe? How come I'm your child? But somebody, God says, ah, you. Your ignorance is finishing you. So you are using that because in your mind you think by believing you have a right to certain things. Believing is the first stage of it. That's why I taught you about the difference between the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of salvation is what we call the kindergarten gospel. You know, like kindergarten? It is the lower level. It is the entrance kind of gospel. Where you come in because of what Jesus has done for you. So you come in to experience the love of God. But once you are in the gospel of the kingdom, because that's what Jesus was here to introduce, must be introduced to you. Because the gospel of salvation guarantees you heaven. It says you will make it to heaven. You will go to heaven. But now the gospel of the kingdom brings heaven to you before you make it to heaven. So you will be a child of God waiting to, wait, to walk in the streets of gold the day you die. Yet there are other people who will walk in the streets of gold while is they are alive. And in your mind, because of ignorance, you will think they are against the will of God. Because according to your ignorance, the only time your life is supposed to make sense is after you die. Why will God allow you to come to this world to suffer? That's why I always told you and I will tell you, Jesus loves you the way you are. But Jesus does not want you to remain the way you are. Ignorance will cause you to remain the way you are. And you'll justify why things are like that. When you come to the state of awareness and you are honest with yourself, 
And the first thing that you need to do in order for you to come to a state of awareness is when you say things like, my life can be better than this. My ministry can be better than this. My calling can be better than this. My family can be better than this. My children can be better than this. The moment you come to that point, you have opened the room for wisdom. But as long as you don't see that your life can be better than what currently is happening in your life, you have closed the door. Does that make sense to somebody? So it's that, that's why the guys who had lepros in the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 and then you read going to chapter 7 and of course the story unfolds in chapter 7. The guys who had uh, lepros who were taken out of Samaria, who were taken out of the city, guess what? They made a decision. If we sit here, we die. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If we go in there, we die. And you know what they said? Die, die. <laughs> Let's go. And the Bible says, as they were marching, the soldiers heard the sound of chariots. Heard an army, yet it was just four guys. And they left gold, food, everything. But it did not just happen. Somebody sat down and said, you know what? It can be better than this. Am I talking to somebody right now? Until you see your life becoming better than what it is as a child of God, you have no room for transformation. Say, talk to me, Apostle. Now, it is important for you to understand then by the Spirit of God and by wisdom that wisdom will cause you to bring out results whether you like it or not. The moment wisdom is at work in your life, results is what people will see. That's why I said if you don't have wisdom, nothing great will be done by you. And one thing about wisdom, Elder Temba, is that you can't fake the presence of wisdom. Your works implicates you. So you can't go around and say, I have wisdom. Wait! Where there is wisdom, there is results. So you can't fake it because wisdom is not just wisdom because you say you have wisdom. Results now are a measuring stick to your wisdom. Listen, we are going somewhere. God is taking us somewhere as a church. God is taking us somewhere as a church. Some of you, even things that you did not think in your life you will attract, you will attract them. Even things that you never thought you would do, you will do them. Even things you never thought you would have, you will have them. Even places you never thought you will go, you will go. Why? Because God is giving somebody here wisdom. Lift up your right hand and say, oh God, give me wisdom. Please be seated. So wisdom is not something that one just stands up and claims to have while they don't have it. Wisdom will expose you because your works will show if you have wisdom or not. Hallelujah. And how do you know, like I said last week, how do you know that the wisdom of God is at work in your life? Number one, wisdom is connected to mighty works. I'm talking about results. And let me say something here as a preacher of the word, so that you guys understand. When I talk about results, that's what I'm talking about, divine wisdom. There is divine wisdom, and there is human wisdom, and there is devilish wisdom. We call it diabolic wisdom, according to the book of James. So, there's, there's a time where somebody uses what we call human wisdom. And there are times where somebody uses what we call God's wisdom. And there are times where other people use devilish, or rather diabolic wisdom. So as long as you are using the wisdom of God, the results that you will produce will lift up the name of the Lord. Wisdom will always produce results. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But now, not just results, but results that will glorify the name of the Lord. Because you can produce results, yet God sees an insult. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People can clap while his God is not happy. Hence, I'm talking about results that will glorify the name of the Lord. When Moses was instructed by God to just touch the stone, 
the Bible says, and Moses striked the stone and water came out. What is water? Results. He was disobedient, but results came. What do you do when results come while you are disobedient? Are you listening? People see results, but Jehovah sees an insult. People are happy, but God is not happy. That's why I'm not a man's pleaser. I will never be. I don't buy nobody's face. If you don't understand what I teach, I'm not called for you. Simple as that. We can argue about it. I won't confuse you. I won't convince you. Otherwise, there is somebody you are going to hear and you must be listening to that person, not me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not a people's pleaser. I'm not in it for likes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or for viewership? I'm on an assignment. I'm a man on an assignment. I'm a man on a mission. So results does not always mean God is happy. Hence, we are not just talking about ordinary results, but we are talking about results that will glorify the name of the Lord. That's why obedience is the most important thing. And let me deal a little bit with obedience because, I mean, I'm laying my foundation after all. When we deal with obedience, a lot of people think obedience is the ability to follow what God said. Yes, that is obedience, but that is not obedience. Say, oh God, oh God. give me wisdom. So obedience, Stimela, it is not just following, son, what God said. But is following what God said in the time he said it. So God can say to you, I want you to do one, two, three, four. And then you do it the week after. And then God does not see that as obedience. So the fact that you did it, it does not mean you were obedient. So the time frame you are given to do it determines if it was obedience or not. That's why when God speaks to you in a time, you jump in a time. That's why when it comes to God, it's all about moments. That's why the Bible says what? Please be serious and thank you. It says the race is not to the swift. Neither the battle to the strong. But time and chance is given to every man. So God is a God of chance and time. So when he speaks something, he speaks it in a time. And that time determines your chance to do it. Jesus came into Jerusalem and he went out and he was crying. And the disciples said, why are you weeping? He looked at Jerusalem and said, they have missed their hour of visitation. Meaning people were there sick, knowing they are trusting God for healing. But when their healing came, they did not take it. But they are still crying for healing. So when it comes to God, it's a matter of moment. That's why I don't play with opportunities when God brings certain people in my life. I don't joke. My wife will tell you. I don't joke with people. People are God's methods. And in life, you know you are blessed when you have people who can hurt you with the truth than to please you with the lie. I'm talking to some of you who only want people around you who can tell you what you want to hear. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's better to have somebody who can hurt you with the truth than to please you with the lie. You need somebody who will tell you you are messing up. And as long as you don't have that person in your life, you have a long way to go. The Bible says a bastard lacks rebuke. Let me put it the way Hebrew says it. He who is without rebuke is a bastard. And scripture continues to say, God, Kina Mahandi, Beleveda, Ukrandia. Listen to this. Came and said, Jacob, I love. Isu, I hate. I said, hey, God, let's have a meeting, you and I. Why will you love Jacob the trickster? And you love, you don't love uh, Isu who was wronged. Isu did not steal Jacob's blessing. It's Jacob who stole Isu's blessing. But why will you come and say, Jacob, I love. Isu, I hate. Why? I had a problem as a, as a preacher of the word. To say God can just come and say I hate you. Yet you did not do. 
I don't know if you guys understand. Because I was trying to find out what did this fellow do that caused God to say what he said. I then realized later as I read where God spoke to, about Jacob that Jacob takes rebuke. He says, I love the ones I rebuke. What that means is if God is rebuking you, he only rebukes the ones he loves. So Jacob was a man who was rebuked in and out of season. You didn't hear that. If you are around people who are supposed to rebuke you, yet they are actually motivating you to do and to mess up, you are with people who hate you. Sometimes I sit down and I say, you know what, I've not had a rebuke. And it doesn't mean I'm doing the right thing. God, I cannot go on like this. I've not been rebuked. Ah. Look, at, look, look at the people. L look, look, look at the people. The people now, they are wondering. Apostle, me, I've never been rebuked. You know what the scripture says about that. I don't have to remind you. He who is without rebuke. Hey, let me not continue. Are, are you still with me here? Yes. Say, talk to me, Apostle. Talk to me, Apostle. Wisdom is the correct scriptural application of knowledge for your profiting. And never forget that. For your profiting. Wisdom is the correct scriptural application of knowledge for your profiting. That is what wisdom is. Are you hearing me? That's why I always said, and I said it, actually, let me, let me go back to what I said during the week. The moment you find yourself, imagine, come on now, everybody pay attention, please look up. God says, remember me, I'm your Lord, your God. I'm the one who gives you power to get wealth. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm the one who gives you what? Power to get wealth. And now you say, I hear you, big man. Wait here. And you start looking for wealth. God just told you, I give you power to get wealth. Now, the moment you find yourself as a child of God, looking for money, you have missed the law. And you will never find money. And that is because money is not missing. Stop looking for it. What I just said, you'll hear it in two years. Don't worry. What I just said is for matured people. Wealth is not missing. Stop looking for it. I want to continue, but the kind of a tone you are looking at me with. Should we just close here? You see, I actually missed the church we had last week. You know, last week we came out at five, half past five, somewhere there, preaching the gospel. And people were there saying, give us more. Should I continue or should I wrap it up? Here? <laughs> you see, there are people there at the back saying, I must stop or something. Are you hearing me? Yes. Wealth is not missing. And once you know that, you will stop doing what you are doing, some of you. It's not missing. No, it's not missing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? One will say, but how do I then get it? God gives you power. That power is wisdom. Are you hearing me? To get it. But there is a mystery in getting it. And let's deal with that a little bit. Write this down. Money is attracted. Wealth, greatness is attracted by who you are becoming more than what you do. Your, e your evolution and transformation is greater than what you do. Some of you, you are so much focused in doing. And even in doing, there are no results. So because there are no results, just humble yourself now and say, you know what, you are right. Okay, teach me now. Because there are people who say, ah, and yet they are doing something. And nothing is taking place. Say, I hear you, Apostle. So becoming, becoming.
before God is greater than doing. That's why scripture says what? He came to his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, to him, to them gave you what? Power to become. Are you hearing what I'm saying? To become. Meaning God wants you to be, but he understands you cannot be until you become. So what attracts greatness is not what you do, but who you are becoming. That's why Jesus was a son of God. 100% man. 100% God. But the Bible says, and Jesus grew in wisdom. What was happening? He was becoming. Jesus grew in stature. What was happening? He was becoming. Jesus grew in favor with God and men. What was happening? He was becoming. And that is because greatness is attracted by who you are becoming than what you do. He did not do because he was a child of God. He went through a process of becoming. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. Should we go deeper there on the mystery of becoming? Say, let's go deeper, Apostle. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, put it there. King James Vision. And we read... Uh, all of us in a count of three. One, two, three. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt, corrupt uh -huh. by flatteries. But, I told you but, so I can't teach on but. But cancels everything. Let's go. Uh -huh. But the people that do know their God shall be what? Shall be strong uh -huh. and do exploits. So it starts with knowledge. The people that know their God. Then the second thing you see there is shall be strong. That's transformation. And do exploits. That, that's action. Knowledge, transformation, action. Sadly, a lot of believers do it vice versa. Action, transformation, knowledge. Doesn't work like that. Hence, I told you, it is not in what you do. It's in who you have become. So it's not action, transformation, knowledge. Just because you are everywhere, it doesn't mean you are somewhere. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. I have seen parents who are being raised by their children. And that is because they are doing it vice versa. Action, transformation, knowledge. The devil is a liar. When the man came to Jesus in Luke and said, what must I do? Look up, please. What must I do to inherit the kingdom? What did Jesus say? Jesus shifted from doing and he said, except a man be. Are you hearing me, somebody? So the man came and said, what shall I do? Why? Because he's focused on doing. I'm giving you a secret. You are a child of God. Our rules is not the rules of the world. The Bible on its own, in, it's in its actual meaning or translation altogether, is the wisdom of God. I don't know if you're the right people. Jesus said, no, no, forget about it. Except a man be. Because being is more important than what? Doing. You must become it. Say, so talk to me, Apostle. You have to become great to attract greatness. Uh -uh. Let me give you another scripture. In the book of Luke, you understand that John, according to the Bible, for a moment, the Bible says, and he grew strong and work strong in the spirit. And he was very great until the day of his showing. Wait, everybody pay attention now, pay attention now. This John we are talking about is John the Baptist. Are you with me? I need you here. I need you. Even you online, I want you, I want you with me here. I want you with me here. John, according to the Bible, John the Baptist, he was very great until his day of showing to Israel. Now I had a problem. Why is John great, yet nobody knows John? No, you are not hearing what I'm saying. Jesus himself came and said, among all prophets, 
born of a woman, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet Luke 1, and you read and you go to verse 80, it says he worked strong in spirit. The man was very great until his day of showing unto Israel. But how is he great? Yet nobody knows him. Does that make sense to you guys? Does that make sense to you guys? Or should I go deeper a little bit? <laughs> Meaning greatness is not something that happens because you do. Greatness is something that happens because you have become. So John became great before he even started preaching according to the Bible. And when he was preaching now, he was attracting who he was. And who he was was greatness. That's why Jesus grew in wisdom before he started preaching. So you have to become great to attract greatness. In life, you only attract what you have become. If you want to attract wealth, you have to become wealthy. And it's an internal thing before it is an external thing. Please be seated. Say, talk to me, Apostle. So you have to become rich to attract the riches. Not in the sense of outside. That's why in the world, you'll hear people living in business saying something like, the better you become, the better you attract. Some of you in relationships now, you are binding the devil. No, it's not the devil. You have attracted who you are. You are praying. And all of us are saying, but God, this man that you sent, you are attracting who you are, some of you. Some of you, it is not the men or the women you meet. It's you. So no matter who you will meet in life, you will build using the same bricks you built your previous relationship. Meaning same wisdom, same approach. You know why most prophetesses are single in life? Uh-uh, the church, hey, we have prophetesses here. 98% of prophetesses in the whole world are single. Doesn't mean they are not prophetesses, but they are single. It's not that they don't, they don't, they are not praying for men. Secretly they are. She'll never listen to a prophetess saying me, no, 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 no. No. Nah. You know, people have a tendency of denouncing something in public that they are praying for in private. No wonder why God does not give it to them. Because God does not entertain hypocrites. So you find a prophet and say, Ah, me! God has called me to preach the gospel. I don't need any man. And in, in private, God. <laughs> and God never gives them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ah, uh ah. -uh. You can't be double-minded when it comes to God. You can't stand here and say, ah, to prosper is a sin. And when you are there, you say, God, please help me now. To No. No. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's what I'm telling you. In fact, 90%, 99%, 99.999% 9 of prophetesses are single. They tried with this one, it doesn't know. If you are going to investigate what I'm talking about, you're going to come back and say, man of God, you are telling the truth. They try with this one or something happens. Not that they are not those ones who are married. They are there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And it's because in life, you attract who you are. So most prophetesses, uh, let me not start the sermon now. <laughs> let me not start it now. You, you guys are pushing me now and I'm going to go there. The first thing that they were supposed to be taught is that being a prophetess is an office. And what that means is, it means power. But power is heavy. You have to lower yourself to pick it up. You are a prophetess. You are given power by the Spirit of God. But you are still a woman. And as a woman, God expects you to carry yourself in a certain way. But most prophetesses can't differentiate 
between what they are given and who they are. So they use what they are given to get to something or to attract something. But when that something comes, deals with who they are. That's why they can spend money attending the school of prophets, but they cannot spend money attending classes that is how to become a godly woman. You're not hearing me. No, no, you're not. No, I know. I'm not saying one has to attend classes, but I'm just giving you an example here. So they invest in the power, not in who they are. But at the end, they will attract who they are. And if it does not work out, they are confused. Because in their minds, I'm a prophetess. The devil must not fight me and my relationship. The devil is not fighting you. You are attracting who you are. So you have the power, but you are not taught that you have to lower yourself. Meaning, though I'm a prophetess, when my man shows up, I submit. Though I'm a seer, but when my man speaks, I hear. So they want to control the congregation and want to control even the husband. I look at the prophetesses, they are angry. I'm trying to help you now. Oh God, look at the faces. Oh Lord. Ah Lord. Ah, Jesu Bantla. Nyetenya siza bandu bankwate. I'm helping. Say, so talk to us, Apostle. If you are not careful, you yourself, you'll end up saying, God wants you single. No, my friend. You attract who you are. What do I mean by this? You first, or you have to first become internally, or you have to become it internally to attract it. It does not matter what it is. Somebody is asking, how do I become? Simple. Can I answer you? Yeah. By knowledge. Knowledge helps you to become. I'm about to say something and I close. The more you learn, the more you earn. Your earning capacity is determined by your learning capacity. That's why it is said that if you know better, you will do, you will do better. Those who are writing, write it down. Everybody has a level of greatness they can handle based on the internal capacity or based on their internal capacity. I will say it in a way that you'll understand because this series is all around wealth transfer. Everybody has a level of wealth or money they can handle based on their internal capacity, who they are. I told you and I will tell you again. Just because you have 15 million, it does not mean you are a millionaire. A millionaire is who you are. 15 million is what you have. As long as you are a 10,000 rent person, even if you can be given 15 million, you are going to misuse that 15 million and your brain will start working when you get to 10,000. When you get like, hey, so what do I do now? Uh, you buy things you don't need. Go to places you don't have to go. Why? You are a 10,000 person. And no matter who prays for you, you won't get help. But if you meet somebody who's a millionaire and you give them that 10,000, already they are thinking, how do I make a million out of this? Why? Because a millionaire is who they are. That's why millionaires, they don't boost on one million or two million in their account. They boost on assets. Because a millionaire is who they are. They understand patience. The power of compound interest. That I can put something here today and in five years when I wake up it will have taken another ten. You, you don't have that patience. 
you put something here. Within 24 hours, you are peaking. Has something happened. Ah. Once you see a move like this, just a move like this. Hey, ah, now I've made money. I'm withdrawing now. <laughs> Some of you, it's greediness dealing with you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You are trying something, but because you are not it, you have not become it, it's difficult for you to attract. That's why some of you, all you need is to become. It's very difficult to want to attract something that you, are, you have not become. I was teaching my son one time, and he was like, my father, my father. How to survive any economy? I said, two things. Increase your income, lower your expenditure. I said, ha, that's powerful. My father, my father. How do you make things happen? Then I had to think. Are you still with me now? That it is not so much in doing but it's so much or oh, it is so much about who I have become you see the difference between somebody who has become I'm answering him but I'm also helping you to understand where I'm going so I was answering him but I'm starting somewhere so that you can understand where I'm going the difference between somebody who has become and somebody who just does is because somebody who just does pay attention look up look up I'm trying to help you now I'm trying to help you I'm trying to help you a, the difference between somebody who does and somebody who has become is that somebody who does, they have convinced themselves that in just doing, something will happen. I'll give an example. They will wake up in the morning and say, what do I do today? And they sit there and say, I must do something. They're thinking, I must do something. What can I do? Not understanding that the energy they are using to think, what must they do? It's being taken out. That's why even if they try to do, they will not do much. What is somebody that has become, before they go to sleep, they have what we call checklist. Tomorrow I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. When we wake up, we know what to do. But for me to get there, I had to become. Oh, yeah. Does that make sense to you guys? Are you, it's more difficult to do something when you are just thinking of doing it then. So your life is not balanced. There are no results. Why? Because you are defocused. It takes wisdom to sit down and take a pen and a paper or a book and put it down and say, in the name of Jesus, I pray for divine wisdom. And as you write now, Kalidi Bahange, God is directing you by his wisdom. Listen, you know when the Bible says write the vision down, the Bible there is telling you the truth. Say, so how do I become a Boston? You become by learning. The more you learn, the more you earn. That's why you can't give a person wealth or money that is beyond their learning capacity. Even God will not. You as a father, as a mother, if you can give your child a baby who's two years 20,000 rents to carry to crash, what makes you think God is going to give you wealth that you have not proven yourself that you can handle? No, just, I'm just asking you. If you can give your child who's five years the 50,000 that you have in your bank account and say, take this 50,000, go to school, and see what you can do. What, do you, what makes you think God will just say, you, God? Write it down. Write this down. You can't give a person wealth or greatness, or money that is beyond their learning capacity. And that is because they will waste the money and reduce it to their level. 
That's why, according to Jesus, if you really want to help someone, don't give them money. Give them knowledge. Hey, the church is quiet. Look for. Let's see what Jesus said. Look for. Verse 18. That's why if you want to really help somebody, don't give them money. Give them knowledge. If you really want to help your children, don't give them money. Give them knowledge. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's it. We can't continue. It settles it. What do the poor need? Come on, church. Church, I'm not the one who wrote it. Come on now. So the poor needs what? Yeah. The gospel is the good news of God. And how does that come? Through knowledge. So he didn't say the spirit of God is upon me. I'm going to bless the poor with money. He said to preach the gospel. Why? Because you can't give a person wealth beyond their learning capacity. And that's because they will waste the money and reduce it to their level. If you really want to help somebody who's poor, if you really want to help them and you have time to help them, don't give them money, give them knowledge. How do I become? You become by learning. How do I learn? What you don't hear, you will never know. What you don't hear twice, you will never remember. What you don't read, you will never understand. Say, talk to me. Have you read the scripture and says, my people die because they lack knowledge? And we said, wisdom is the correct scriptural application of what you know. Meaning wisdom cannot be wisdom until somebody knows something. Because it is in wisdom that you apply what you know. So, some of you, it is not wisdom that maybe is supposed to come. It's knowledge. Because wisdom is applying what you know. So, you, some of you here, what are you going to apply? You see what I'm talking about? And what some of you don't understand is that right now you are gaining knowledge because your spirit is enlightened. While it's you are seated, an apostle is seated, you are focused like this. And guess what? Your spirit man is being built. One time I wanted to help somebody. I said, you know what? I, you see, sometimes, sometimes, you know, if you have walked the walk in some of these things in life, you can easily go to somebody and say, hey, Muna, I'm trying to move you this way, you know. Uh, let's do this or do this and do this. And because they don't know what you know, then they go, I know I will do it this way. And you let them do it that way. And after, I don't know if you have ever been there, even ch especially children. And after they try their way and it does not work and they come back to you and say, hey, Muna, uh, please uh, sort me out. Only to realize that you don't have time to sort them out. Or already you are sorting them. You are, you are sorting somebody out. Sometimes God will bring men to redirect your destiny. And because you are too busy thinking at that moment, no, it's supposed to be like this. You realize later that uh -uh, it was never supposed to be like that. But now the problem is that when you go back, it will be too late. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hence, I started by telling you that obedience is not just following or doing what God instructed, but it is also doing it in a time frame. Wisdom is a principal thing. The Bible says, by wisdom shall a man build a house. By wisdom, a house is built. You want to build your life. You want to build your family. You want to build your career. You want to build your business. You want to build things in your life. Get wisdom. Because wisdom will help you build a house. And I believe by the Spirit of God, 
that we are now ready to deal with the different types of wisdom and what wisdom does what and which one does what because it's very useless for us to take about to talk about different types of wisdom or wisdom sorry and not explain to you how wisdom is supposed to be treated wisdom is simply you applying what you know kila barande vegdili karunda la akravasia you need to be so much concerned about who you are becoming more than what you are doing. Some of you, you are becoming things that you never prayed for. And the devil himself is very excited. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'll give an example in what I'm saying. Your mind can't stop wondering. You are thinking evil. You have entertained, you are, you are now entertaining things that you are not entertaining before. You have not gone out to do the actions or to act on it. But the enemy is working on you becoming it first. That the moment you go out and the moment you start it, to stop you it will be impossible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, oh Lord, oh Lord. Help me with wisdom. It's not wrong to ask for wisdom. The Bible says if you lack wisdom, ask God, meaning you can pray for wisdom. Imagine, God made sure that you can even pray for wisdom. And somebody can pray for you to receive wisdom. Remember Deuteronomy 34 where we read last week that Moses prayed for Joshua and laid his hand on him and the spirit of wisdom came on him and the children of Israel hearkened to him as a young uh, uh, person, as an old person in this season, trust God for wisdom. In this season, pray for wisdom. Wisdom will help you to know who is who around you. You know, it is wisdom that helps you see a destiny of somebody who has not become. Where you will not judge a person because of who they are now. Eat them. No. Wisdom will help you know this person at this point in time, this is where they are. But in five years, this is where they are going to be. That's why your mentor must be a man or a woman of wisdom. That's why your man of God, a woman of God, must be a man or a woman of wisdom. Because if they don't have wisdom, you'll be getting lost while is they are watching. You'll be getting lost while is they are there. Say, help me, God. Are you guys ready for part two of this episode that we have started? It does not look like it. Let me check online if the people are here. Are you here, church? Let me start with the church. Are you here, church? Are you here, church? Are you here, church? I want to pray for our offering. And I want us to bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done for us. And thank you for what you have given us. We believe we have because, Lord, you have provided Right now, as we give, we declare that we will attract every kind and every blessing that is attached to giving. Be it uh, spiritual blessings, be it earthly blessings. Our giving today will open a door for us and we will never be the same again. Our giving today will not only transform us financially, but will also transform us spiritually. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that men shall come. Men shall show up. Because scripture declares in the book of Luke, give it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I shall cause men to come and give unto you. We pray that men shall come in this season. In the name of Jesus, help us shall come in this season. 
we are doing away with the mindset of smallness and emptiness. But Father, we are embracing abundance, greatness, and more than enough. In the name of Jesus, we curse every spirit of want and we curse every spirit of poverty and we curse every spirit of lack. In the name of Jesus, we declare and we decree that in this month of open heaven, our lives shall never be the same again. Everything we do, everything we touch, we shall experience an open heaven. Even in our finances, oh God, we trust you for nothing but an open heaven. In the name of Jesus, say that is so somebody. It's giving time. Blessing time. Let us go ahead and give God what we have. It's offering time now. Those who are tithing as well, go ahead and give God your tithe. And I'm going to pray for you. If you're online, you can come church and give. Those who are ready to give. If you're online, go ahead and give God your tithe. And I will pray for you just after everybody has given. God bless you, Michelle, for your beautiful message on YouTube. Just go ahead and uh, give God. It's offering time. It's giving time. And I did mention that this season is our season of sowing. Hence, the Lord spoke to us and released the word that it shall be a month of open heaven. God shall open the windows of heaven and they shall be blessings poured unto us. God bless you, Yolanda. God bless you, Erica. God bless you, Ina. God bless everybody that is giving. Go ahead and give God your offering, your tithe. Oh, 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 oh,
I want to quickly pray for those who are tithing. I understand that those who are still giving are still giving. Wherever you are online, just continue to give if you are still giving. I just want to pray for those who are tithing. If you are tithing and you have tithed, whether online or you are here, if you are here, just come to the front. And if you are online and that was your tithe, please lift up your right hand wherever you are. I just want to quickly pray with and pray for those that are tithing. here please lift up your hand and I'm just going to quickly going to pray for you so um, look at me so whenever I'm teaching you here because you're tithers so hands have prophetic uh, any we talk up when we talk about prophetic symbols um, you need to understand what you are doing with your hands at what time so when we do this two things are involved Either we are worshiping or we are surrendering. So when you worship or you are surrendering. But when you are receiving, are we together? That's why when we are now, when you lift up your right hand, that is your hand of authority, your hand of strength. That's what the Lord says, I shall hold you with my right hand. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you lift them up straight without opening them, that is a sign of victory. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you are receiving now, and I'm praying for you, you just, like that. Don't just go ahead and lift up your hand like that. And if you are watching, you can go ahead and also lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every tithe. In the name of Jesus. That your spirit will guide them, O oh God, in every area of their lives. Especially in the area of their finances. They shall have divine wisdom, divine revelation where they will know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and who to do it with. I pray that, Heavenly Father, you shall increase them, you multiply them. In the name of Jesus, you enlarge their territory. I rebuke the devourer of their progress, the devourer of their harvest. I declare and I decree that they shall be wisdom, O God, to manage and to multiply what you have given them. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Be blessed. Say, I'm blessed. You can go ahead and put on your tithe and God bless you.